Hey, I'm Sam and I do design, and in the video today, I am going through my lecture for what makes a good portfolio. Before all of this kicked off, I was actually scheduled to visit some universities across the UK and give a lecture on what I believe makes a good portfolio. I already had the lecture prepared, so I thought instead of waiting for all of this to blow over, I could bring the lecture to you. The way that I would normally start this lecture is to just say that I'm just one opinion. You don't need to listen to everything that I say, and you can take it all with a pinch of salt and run with it. So don't take what I say word for word. So let's back up and think about what actually is a CV and a portfolio. Number one, a CV is a long form business card that gets printed and passed around. And it's kind of like a stat sheet for who you are as a designer. But we'll get more into that later on. A portfolio is proof that you have the skills that you say you do in your CV. And they both get you an interview. They are the key that opens the lock and gets you into the door. So they are the first impression that you can give any recruiting manager or designer before they even meet you. I don't know anything about your life and I don't know what grade you got. I don't know the charity work you did. So a CV is the first thing that's gonna introduce you to me. It's a showcase of your best work, which means that you only need to put your best work in. Actually, I think a good saying is you are only as good as your worst project in your portfolio. And above all else, it is a product. It is something that you can design and it has a use and it has an end user and you can take everything that you normally take into consideration when you're designing a product into designing a portfolio. So your portfolio is an advertisement for your skills as a designer. And the way that I like to think about it is your portfolio can become like a magazine of your skills. If you go out and you buy a Wired magazine, you're buying that magazine because you're interested in that topic as a whole. But within that magazine, you have different articles and different newsletters that each tell their own story and make their own narrative within that whole collection as well. So how do magazines capture attention? Because at the end of the day, you need to capture the attention of the hiring manager or the designer that's looking over your portfolio. Number one, they tell stories. A good portfolio takes the reader on a journey through the project. Number two, they show the process. So it's really important not to just show the fancy, shiny renders at the end of the project. You need to show the whole process from start to finish. And number three, they are beautiful. Don't forget, if I'm looking at a portfolio to hire someone, I need to be able to look through as many portfolios as I can and I'm only gonna look through the ones that are the most beautiful to look at. I'm not gonna hurt my eyes to help you out. So if we've spoken about the portfolio being a magazine and each project inside of it is going to be its own separate story, what is the formula that you need to be able to tell a good story? Number one, the front cover of not only the portfolio, but of each project itself. I need to know exactly what the project is about before I start looking at all the behind the scenes and all the story and all the process that led up to it. I need to know the finished product as the first thing that you show me. Then you can get to the messy middle. So in design education, we talk about the design squiggle and we know that at the start of the design process, there's no right or wrong answer. It's very messy. You, you're checking every single avenue and every single possibility. And as the design starts to get finalized and more refined, you can then start to see where the project will end up. If you start your project in your portfolio with the messy middle, and I don't know as someone who's looking at your portfolio for the first time, then I'll actually start to design it in my head before I get to the final solution at the end of the project in your portfolio. And chances are, because I'm looking at the project from an outsider's perspective, my design will be completely different to your design and I'm probably going to prefer my design over yours. Just <laughs> That's just how it goes. So you need to tell me up front with the front cover exactly what the project is about. And then end your project with the finale. Don't just leave it with the CAD drawings or the DWGs that you sent off to the manufacturers. I need to see this thing in the real world. Whether that is if you had models made or if it went into production or if you just need to render it in Keyshot, I need to see how it's going to look in the real world. The reason why I've shown it like this with the rings extending out from the finale 
is because showing the in-context shots at the end makes it seem like there's endless possibilities for that project in the future. Use this formula for every single project in your portfolio. So what do you include in the portfolio? What types of projects? Well, you've got your list of projects that you've done over the course of university or over the course of the time that you spent being a designer. And you've got the type of work that the company does that you want to apply to. It's that crossover that you need to include. I was applying to a company that does the set design for red carpet events. I turned up to the interview with a portfolio full of products. And while I could show that I can design products and meet specifications and communicate with manufacturers, eventually I realized that I wasn't going to get the job because I didn't have the projects that they needed to see in the portfolio. And the way that I like to say it is you need to show the company that you're already doing the work that they need help with. And because of that, each portfolio needs to be tailored to the job you're applying for. Nobody said applying for a job isn't hard work. So what are my eight top tips for a killer design portfolio? Number one, tell the story of the project. You need to tell me all the decisions you made, all the hardships you faced, every obstacle you overcame to get to the end beautiful render at the very end. Show your skills naturally as the project calls for it. So what I see all the time is people separate their skills into different pages. Like here is my sketching page. Here is my rendering page. Here is my uh, model making page. And they just separate them all out and they pull in the sketching from lots of different projects and they pull in the renderings from lots of different projects and they just put them all on a mishmash together in a page. That's not the right way to do it. Uh, in my opinion, you should um, keep the story of the project intact and show the skills as it calls for in the uh, project. So because of that, you have to show your decision making. No project is as easy as people on the internet would like you to believe. And it's really important to show the shortcomings of the project and show how you overcame the obstacles and maybe even uh, think about how you would redesign it if you've missed the deadline or if, if it's gone off to manufacture and it's, and it's beaten and said and done. How would you redesign it now? Those different aspects and those more those deeper insights can really help when you're applying for a job. Keep a clean layout with minimal text. If you've seen any of my portfolio reviews in the past, you all know I do not read any of the paragraphs that people put in the pages. So definitely keep text to a minimum. It needs to be visually stunning. It is a piece of design at the end of the day. It is a piece of design that you can craft in the same way that you would any other product. Number six, only show your best work. Don't put any filler projects in because you're only as good as your worst project. Include your contact details. The amount of people that we've had to turn away while I've been looking through portfolios in the past because they haven't put contact details on is way too high. Don't forget to put an easy way for us to contact you if you want to get a job. Number eight, decide how the reader will use it. So what I mean by that is if you turn up to a job interview and you have a portfolio in physical form, it's in a book format, and you know exactly what pages to turn to figure out what projects you want to talk about. Uh, it shows that you have crafted that portfolio really well. If you don't know what uh, order the projects are in and you're scrambling through all the pages and you're, everyone's trying to turn pages over each other, you know, it's, it's a lot less refined. Um, so you need to make sure that when you arrive to your interview, you can use your portfolio naturally whether that's in a printed book, in a PDF portfolio, printed out on lots of individual cards that you can hand out around the room. Make sure you've planned exactly how you're going to use that portfolio so you're not scrambling for sheets of paper or wondering what page you're in in your book. Make sure you've planned it. This is what not to do. Do not segregate the skills into pages. So like I was saying, don't have a sketching page, uh, then have a rendering page. Make sure it fits within the context of the project. Do not, and I cannot stress this enough, do not use a star rating to measure your skill level. Um, I, I, I've done it in the past, I will agree. 
but it's definitely not the right thing to do. And the reason is, let's say that you've put your four out of five stars in Photoshop, for example. Um, there's no way of measuring that at all. And I can tell, as someone who's looking through your portfolio, I can tell how good you are at Photoshop because of the skills and, you know, because of the projects that you've got in there. So you don't need to tell me how good you think you are at Photoshop because I can tell you how good you are in my own head. And also you're only comparing yourself to yourself. Um, you know, like four out of five stars in Photoshop would mean you're pretty, pretty good at Photoshop and maybe I need to learn from you, uh, which might be the case and that's cool. But I could, I'll be able to tell that from the uh, projects in your work. What I get people are trying to say is, I am most confident in Photoshop when compared to programs like InDesign and Illustrator. And I understand that. I get that that's what people are trying to say, but save that for the interview, okay? Save that for the first day on the job when someone says, hey, can you use Illustrator? And you go, actually, I'm not so confident, but I'll try and give it a go. Um, that is when that conversation should be had. You're shutting the door if you say you're a two out of five in Illustrator before you even get an interview. Um, so do not put the stats on your CV. Do not have typos. Uh, the amount of times that I've seen people with typos or even graphically laid out um, errors. So one example is if you have a paragraph of text and have just one word on a line at the very end because it wasn't uh, small enough to fit on the word, on the line before, that one word is called an orphan or a widow. I can't remember which one, but seeing one word on a line on its own in a paragraph is a big no-no. And um, once you realize that there are these typographical, graphical layout tricks and tips, uh, once you see that people break those rules and, and don't really pay attention to those details, they stick out like a sore thumb. So don't uh, have orphans, don't have widows in your paragraphs. Um, and yeah, typos, big no-no. Don't change the type of the portfolio that the company has requested. So what I mean by that is when I used to look through portfolios at my old company, we would specifically ask for a PDF portfolio. Now, the reason is because we had a server that we could store those portfolios on. And if the job wasn't quite right for that specific designer at the time, then we could uh, archive their portfolio. But when the job came that meant that they were a good fit, we could always go back in, search the archive because it was a, a PDF that is searchable and we could contact them after that. That is why we asked for PDF portfolios. Some people wanted to submit online portfolios, some people wanted to submit physical portfolios, but at the end of the day, we had asked for a specific file type and uh, it, went, it matched with our system and it matched with our workflow. So anyone that was submitting portfolios that didn't match that file type, sure, they might have been trying to say, I'm different from everybody else, I'm creative, uh, look at me. Uh, but what they were actually saying is, I can't follow instructions. Uh, which is a, a big deal breaker. So if the company has specified a specific portfolio type, then absolutely do that type. Uh, do not have a portfolio larger than 10 megabytes. Um, a lot of people struggle with this, especially student designers. I see portfolios arriving that are 15 megabytes, 20 megabytes. Um, and honestly, it's lucky for me that I don't have a cap on the limit of files that I can receive, but a lot of HR people in big companies have file limits on the emails they can receive. So potentially you can only have a two megabyte, five megabyte email reach the HR people that you need to be able to get a job. So don't forget that you need to compress your portfolios as much as possible with keeping the quality. I do have a video on that on my YouTube channel. I will link to that in the top right hand corner. Uh, but yeah, do not have files larger than 10 megabytes. So useful links. This is the time that people normally start to take out their notebooks and start to jot things down. Don't forget that you can check out things on uh, Behance, Pinterest, The Dots, uh, web pages like that for inspiration. But you can also look at 
uh, physical type and physical magazines, like I was saying, like Kinfolk, Hole and Corner, Wired Magazine and Wallpaper Magazines. And you can look at those for the way that they use uh, layout and uh, typographical elements to really tell the story and make the uh, images speak for themselves. Uh, know Your Onions is a book that I read um, for graphic design and it, it taught me a lot about graphic design. Obviously, as a product designer, I do need some graphic design knowledge because of doing all the portfolios and doing uh, the stuff in work, actually. So that was a really interesting book. And also, don't forget that um, you can watch my YouTube tutorials on Samda's design. Uh, obviously, if I was saying this in a real lecture... Uh, then I would definitely make sure to uh, to make sure people wrote that down. And just to make sure that they write that down, I uh, I just double, doubled that up just a little bit, just to drive the point home. So there it is. That's my really fast lecture on what I think makes a good portfolio. Normally in a lecture slot of about an hour, I'd have two or three of these presentations and I'd just go through them and answer questions at the end. So to keep in tradition with that style of format, let me know the questions that you have down in the comments below and I will do my best to answer all of them. As always, if you learned anything in this video, don't forget to let me know down in the comments as well because I love reading about it. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button and the bell button and everything else that YouTube asks you to do. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.